Welcome to Science and Non-Duality. What is non-duality? The universal forces. It's the collective conscious. Being aware. Trauma is not the external event that happens. Trauma is the impact of that event, which is the disconnection from ourselves. That matter is energy. Energy is matter. That's what EMC squared is about. There's a language without nouns. There is a language without subjugation. There's a language without objectifying. But if it's recorded, then we there is a collapse. But if it's not, then it's the infinite potentiality. Welcome back, and we are delighted to introduce our next guest, guest. Rezma Menaken. Rezma. Rezma is a New York Times bestselling author of My Grandmother's Hand, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. He's a visionary justice leadership coach, therapist, and trauma specialist who educates about how all of us carry the history and traumas of our ancestors in our bodies. Resma is a leading voice in today's com- conversation on racialized trauma and has developed an embodied approach which he calls somatic abolitionism. What we most of all love about Resma is that he's not here to make us feel all fuzzy and comfortable, but he's here to challenge us, to help us make the invisible visible. So he's not going to hold punches. It's always such a joy to interface with you. And it's such an honor to have you with us today again, Resma. Welcome. Welcome, Resma. I am happy to be here. Thank you both. It's good to see your faces. It's good to see you, Gabor. How are you? Good, Resma. Thank you for being with us. Um, well, thank you for having me. Can I plunge in? Absolutely. Let's get it. Okay. Well, the first question, I, I want to ask about your work, but before I do, I just want you to teach me about something. Okay. Um, this is a conversations on race these days, particularly since the death of George Floyd, have become both very forefront and important and also very delicate. And I'll tell you an experience that I had, and I, I'm going to ask you to your forthright comment on it, okay? Mm-hmm. I was teaching a course with these guys, Zaya and Maurizio, uh, some months ago, and I was talking about racism. And I was trying to make the point that the racism is a problem of the racist. It's not a primary problem of the subject of it. It becomes a problem for them, but it, it originates in a racist. And I quoted James Baldwin, where he... And I quoted him verbatim. I'm not going to do it this time. I've learned better. Mm -hmm. But he said, I'm not your Mm -hmm. N-word. And then he said, said, America needs to ask themselves why they created the N, because that's not who I am. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would quote that as a wonderful way of illustrating my point, that it's in the mind of the racist that the whole thing Mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. I was criticized for using the word. Yeah. And and, And my first response was, what are you talking about? I'm just quoting the guy. I'm just quoting verbatim, a black, mm-hmm. a wonderful black author. Mm-hmm. And then I realized afterwards, no, maybe I'm not so right about that. That maybe intellectually mm-hmm. I'm right, mm-hmm. but in today's context, I don't have the right to say that. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and that I need to be aware of the impact on my audience of what I'm saying, mm-hmm. not just whether I'm intellectually right or not. I wonder if mm-hmm. you could comment on that incident and what I could learn yeah. from. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first off, I just want to say, may the ancestors guide what I say as well as what you say back to me. Um, yeah. the, the first piece of that is that this is why I began to do some of the work that I, that I'm doing with regard to racialized trauma, because we are not start, we don't start at the same points in terms of reference. We don't, as me walking around in a black body, um, is, is different than someone walking around or you walking around in a, in a, in a white body. This is just different. And, and the structural pieces and the stru- and the philosophical pieces that exist around race, just because you have a individual, um, um, idea that you want to express or, 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 or an individual thing that you want to say, many times we don't account for the communal impact of that word. We just feel like, okay, I should be able to say this because I'm just quoting somebody. I'm not trying to hurt somebody, right? Um, and, and this is a problem of, of structure in that we assume that people should, should, should allow us to do things and say things because of our intent. Of because of what is in our hearts. And what I try and tell people all the time is that you, your niceness and your kindness is inadequate to deal with the level of brutality that me and my people and bodies of culture experience every day. 
So when that person said to you, you should not be using that word. Let, let, let me give you an, a different story. Yeah. In my, me and my wife built this house that we're in now. We built this house uh, about 20 years ago. Um, that word has never been used in my house. Hmm. My son is, is uh, getting ready to be 20 years old. He has never heard me say that word. Mm. That word comes out and is part and parcel to a structure that was trying to make a, another entity that was considered not to be human. That's what that word means. That word, that word is about reinforcing, structurally reinforcing the idea that I am a species unlike other species that 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 the idea of race was is actually a term that Europeans used um, to describe the language of race was used to describe species that's the part that we forget is that when they talked about species when Europeans began to talk about species they talked about they talked about race in the concept of a race of dog a race of cat a race of bird a race of fish it was a species term and they turned around and used that term to uh, uh for the savages quote unquote that they came into contact with for the for the africans that they came into contact with for the asian bodies and the indigenous bodies that they came into contact with. So the race question in this country is literally a species question. And there is viciousness and power and brutality in the languaging. So what the person was, was saying to you is that what you are saying coming out of your mouth, coming out of your body, given this structure is brutal and vicious and is hurtful. Um, and I would, and, and, and what the person was, was also saying, and I would ask, by me saying this to you, that you tend to your own whiteness and your own advantage in this structure, and so I don't have to deal with your brutality. Well, thank you. Um, let me tell you, any, um, any, an even subtler nuance here, for me at least, I grew up in Hungary, um, a child of the Holocaust, I mean, literally, I, I was an infant. Uh, and there was a lot of anti-Semitism when I was growing up. I certainly didn't feel part of the majority. I was mm -hmm. called a Jew, and uh, and 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 I remember a friend of mine coming to my defense once, saying, "Leave him alone. It's not his fault that he's Jewish." Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. so I didn't grow up with any sense of I belong to this majority yeah. master race idea. But then I come to Canada. Come on with it. And now I'm now I'm part of the colonializing society. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, I'm no longer a despised minority. I, I become identified as a white male. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it's uh -huh. Uh -huh. confusing sometimes, isn't it? it it's, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's contextual. The other thing yeah. that you bring up is that people don't often realize this, but the, the whole idea of race came along very specifically with the rise of colonialism and capitalism. People didn't always have that concept. Exactly. It, it, that, that concept served a particular purpose absolutely that you, that you touched upon absolutely so 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 um the the idea so one of my organizing rubrics like when i'm doing work with people i'm doing work with communities i'm doing work with bodies i'm actually in minneapolis now um uh, um, um, where a lot of things are happening and have been happening for years with regard to um, the apparatus of the state called the police and black and indigenous bodies. And one of the things I, I, I start with is I always say that um, the white body deems and has deemed itself the supreme standard by which all bodies' humanity shall be measured structurally and philosophically. And if you don't understand that point, everything else will confuse you about how race functions, right? Not, not, not how we wish it would function, but how it literally functions. And that, that, that idea, that philosophy of the white body being the standard of humanness and every other body being a deviant from that standard. That piece got woven and is woven through and around every institution 
that exist. And so white bodies don't have to walk, walk around here saying that, you know, I'm racist or I believe this or I believe that, bl- that white bodies are superior and black bodies and indigenous bodies are not. They don't have to do that because they have created structures that actually carry that out. Right. Um, and so there is no example. What the white body, the white body collective really has no, no collective acuity or collective agility when it comes to understanding race because you haven't had to, right? Um, we all have marginalized pieces to us. Like, like you said, you, you, you're a Jewish man. You come from, a, a, a Jewish people. Um, and so they, though, they are marginalized pieces. At the same time, that does not take the the white piece off of the table. It right. must be considered at the same time. Thank you. Now, which then brings me, I want to, but, but, but your work is very salient for is that you ground everything in the body. Mm-hmm. And, um, so, and, and it's somewhere in your book, uh, my mother's grand hand, and you, you open your book, My Grandmother's Hands, with this beautiful yeah. description of your grandmother's oh. hand. You know, yeah, thank you. And, and, and throughout the book, you really much stay in the body. Mm-hmm. Now, at a certain point, um, you talk about what you call dirty pain. Yeah. And so yeah. I'd like to ask you about that, but let me read you first something. I was reading Not Max's autobiography um, not mm. long ago, and he, and he, one of the one of the most disturbing scenes in the book is there he's the young Malcolm standing in front of a mirror trying to conk his hair, trying to make his hair lighter and straighter than than, than its natural curls. And he says, this is my first really big step towards self-degradation, literally burning my flesh to have to have a look like a white man's hair. And then he talks to a nation of Islam some years later, later and he says, who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such an extent that you bleach to get like a white man? Who taught mm-hmm. you to hate the shape of your nose and lips? And so that... What you're saying, what I hear you saying, and what, what, what's certainly evident in Malcolm's work, is that quite apart from the fact that you can't enter certain restaurants until, you know, while segregation ruled, or that there's structural discrimination on, on the job site, there's actually a way that racism enters the body. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I, I'm going to ask you to talk about that, that, that yeah. what the body supremacy does to the, yeah. to the people who are at the receptive end of it. So, so about seven months ago, eight months ago, well, actually it's a little longer now. It's about a year that the whole COVID thing has thrown my sense of timing off is somewhat disoriented me. But, uh, uh, I got asked to, to do a speech at, um, the, it was a national association of uh, gynecologists and they mm-hmm. wanted me to come and talk a little bit about racialized trauma, stuff like that. And one of the things that I usually do when I'm invited to go to things like that is, I go early to hear what other people are saying. I, like, like, mm. are other br- people bringing in this racialization context? Are they bringing in the the, the idea that that um, racialization and, and racism and white body supremacy is actually um, it actually corrodes, it actually weathers? And so, what happened was that I went and I was listening, and almost time after time, as I was listening. People, no, people were talking about things like low birth rate of, of children, uh, to black mothers. People were talking about how black mothers were dying more often in, um, in, uh, giving birth. Um, people were talking about, um, all of these types of things that show up. Uh, people were talking about vaginal fibroids in black women and how that's showing up and stuff like that. And so as I'm listening, I, I do this thing that I call soul scribing. So I begin, as I'm listening to people, I begin to write on what am I experiencing in the, in my body and the body of the experience and around me and in the larger field. What am I experiencing as I'm listening to this? And one of the things that happened, um, is that, uh, I find it curious that in the conference where they're talking about low birth weight or, or children dying um, um, that uh, 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 in, during uh, during pregnancy and children and, and and black mothers dying is that we never say ask the question around is there any impact of people of women. Um, having an experience, their body having an experience being tied to their caregivers where their bodies had been raped for 250 years. Yeah. 
Like, do, do we, do we have in any, do, in this discussion, is there any room to talk about that some of these bodies come from bodies of people who had been raped and brutalized for 250 years? And might that had have shaped both the cortisol levels, the, in, the, the norepinephrine, uh, norepinephrine levels, the adrenaline levels in that body, and then become, de- becomes decontextualized. Trauma, the march of time decontextualizes trauma. And what happened is, is that if you never remember what happened, you internalize that what happened, that, that thing that happened as being a defect in you. And so, and so when I'm talking about the body, what I am saying is that I am connected to bodies that had brutal treatment and they could, they had to organize themselves around that brutality, that viciousness. And that brutality and viciousness became decontextualized across time. So by the time it gets to me, I only sense it as notion. By the time it gets to me, I sense it as vibes. By the time it gets to me, I sense it as meaning making or urges or sensation. And that at that point, I, I, I sense in myself that something is wrong, defective or fraudulent in me because I don't see anybody expressing the same thing that I'm expressing individually that actually happened communally. Yeah. Um I gave you a comment on a couple of statistics. Um, I'm just writing a new book, and I was looking at the impact of society on on health. Um, black women, the more experience of racism they un- have to endure, the greater the risk for asthma. Mm-hmm. And you were talking about gynecologists. Mm-hmm. The recent studies showed that black children born under the care of white obstetricians have doubled the risk of dying than, than black children born under the care of black obstetricians or black physicians. I just read that. Yeah. How, how do you explain that? Because racism is not episodic. Racism is structural. Racism yeah. is not something that just happens because we recognize that we see something. Oh, uh, Sister Breonna mm-hmm. Taylor got murdered. Oh, uh, Brother uh, George Floyd got murdered. We see these things as episodic as opposed to structural. So the yeah. way that I explain it is that um, is that it is so it is so it is so much a part of the structure. It's like it's like being in the water and looking for the shark, but without realizing that the water is actually white body supremacy. It is the it is that we are ingesting this and have ingested these pieces, and and because it's predicated on white body supremacy, more often than not, white bodies in particular don't question it because it's like the water. And so for me, the, the idea that you, ha- you have these types of, st- uh, of statistics across time, yeah. this is not just something that's just happening now. These statistics, you, you can look across time. And if, you don't, if, you don't, if we don't begin to understand that what we have to do is not come up with better tools, but what we have to do is literally develop a living embodied anti-racist culture and practices that the idea of just getting tools is insufficient and inadequate to deal with the pervasiveness and the persistency of white body supremacy. So that's how I explain it. Doctors are trained in these in in these hospitals without ever having to really question the impact of racialization and white body supremacy, not only on their patients but on themselves. Yes. Now this is where I think your concept of somatic abolitionism comes in, Absolutely. where whereas I understand you saying it's not just a question of institutionally or cognitively or on a legal level, right. Uh, um, uh, addressing racism, but actually right. on the body level. Exactly right. Exactly right. So, so can you we say have, more? That's a that's yeah, a we, concept. Can you say more? Yeah, about that? we ha- we have we have to we. Ha- this is what I'm saying about the idea of it being episodic. So when we look at what happened here in America, when we look at what happened at um, on on January 6, where you had mobs of of white uh, people. Sorry, going, sorry, interrupt, but you know what happened on January sixth. What? It was my birthday. Oh, <laughs> you thought that was going to say this? <laughs> no. Yeah, thank you that, for, that thank happened. You, thank, you, thank you for mentioning it. <laughs> yeah, that happened too. But 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 yeah. when you have people who 
who who uh, who who go into the capital looking for people to hang and murder and defecate and 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 and, and, and pee in the halls and hang nooses and say Jews will not replace us and 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 and, and wear t-shirts that 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 intimate uh that uh, Auschwitz was a good place to be um when you when you see that level of depravity um you know you're working with something cultural you're not working with just bad people right you're working with something that's so seeded into the very soil of America right the, this race thing that i talk about existed before america became america america did not become legally america until 17 to 1776 the race question the idea of who i am in comparison and being able to see who is human by by using the pigmentation as shorthand um that idea started in the 1600s so this idea of trying to just think our way out of it is inadequate. We're not going to be able to come up with the with the nice little tool or the nice way to think about this thing or or having a courageous conversation or get people to talk about it without understanding that we must actually create a culture that can actually hold the 400 years, 500 years, 600 years of charge, energetic charge that race and racism and white body supremacy is. We so often slam people into a room together and we don't take the time to create a container so things can emerge up out of the container. So a new culture can emerge that is literally embodied, that is a living embodied culture. We don't have that. And so part of a lot of the work that I'm doing is, is helping people begin to create this sense of culture by, 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 by using the body, by using those pieces that show up, by using those, by using override energy, by using those pieces, not as a testimony to my defectiveness, but as energy for fueling for my freedom. And those pieces have to be done in an intimate way, body to body, not people just going to a workshop on racism or DEI work. One of the things I say about, about diversity and equity work is that one of the underlying questions and why a lot of bodies of culture don't like going to those things is that we never ask the question, diverse from what? Yeah. Because if you're going to diversify from something, you're saying you're, sta- you're starting with some type of standard first, and then you're diversifying from it. Right. If you're starting with inclusion, you're saying you're starting with a standard first and you're going to include something in it. But we never say what that thing is. And we all know it, that when we say diversity, what we really mean is that we are interested in diversifying from the concept that the white body and particularly the white male body, the the white male elite body, the body that has power and control over others, that, that we're diversifying from that as being the standard of humanness. But if you never say that, Diversity can end up being like matzo ball Tuesday and collard green Wednesday and cancer Thursday. It ends up being very aesthetic as opposed to deep, uh, a deep sense of culture. You know, I've had the same reaction in the medical field when people talk about alternative medicine. My question is yes. alternative to what? Yeah. And yeah. It kind of assumes that there's a hierarchy in right. which Western um Biological medicine is, is is the standard, and everything else is just an alternative. Rather exactly. than okay, now yeah, you make well, a let very, me just say that what, what you just said, Gabor, is very important. You, if you don't say, if you don't say that Western that the idea of Western medicine has been standardized, right, yeah. and it got standardized in a partic- in a very particular racialized way. Yeah. If you don't say that, then what happens is, is that people see we have been we have been um, conditioned to believe that Western medicine is medicine itself, yeah. and everything else is a deviance from that standard. And if you never call it, it continues to operate as such. to a 
somewhat surprising statement in your book. Maybe surprised to, it was startling to me when I first read it. Um, <clears throat> let me just find it, page um, 47. You say that um, it's easy to see how white body supremacy has created some wounds for many millions of African-American bodies over the past three centuries. It is less obvious what the inflicting of that trauma has done to white bodies. Mm, mm, mm. Um, now, well, then let me just say, confess something here, okay? And I, I mean, this be, I don't know how this will sound, but I'll tell it to you anyway. Um, I remember Eldridge Cleaver in his book, Soul on Ice, mm -hmm. uh, ta talking about Elvis Presley coming along and thawing the frozen white asses of, of white people. Th th this kind of a, uh, when I look at black bodies, now this is maybe reverse racism. I'm just being open about it. You tell me what you it. I feel kind of envy mm. because, because more, somehow more free in their bodies, more loose, more grounded yeah. than I'm capable of being. Am I fantasizing or is there something to that? Well, let me say it like this. Um, for, for, I talk about this idea of what happened to the white body, the poor yeah. white body at the yeah. hands of elite white bodies for a thousand years. I'm just going right after the fall of the Roman Empire. And the, the time that we know as the Middle Ages and some Dark Ages, stuff like that, that for yeah. a thousand years, elite white bodies pillaged, raped, brutalized, stole land, um, right. enslaved, uh, 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 poor white bodies um, right. uh, for a thousand years. And then after 500 AD, and then at some point, uh, that body started to maneuver around the world. Right. That that body, that brutalization never dealt with in the white body. Right. And so what happens is, is that as that white body starts to move around, once that white body starts to come into contact with other with other bodies, what happens is, is that when you are victimized by something. Right. You don't just learn the victim pieces. You yeah. also learn the perpetrator pieces. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the part that we forget is that the underbelly of victimization, the underbelly is perpetration because you learn both. Right. Yeah. And so what happened was, and, and this is my belief, is that that thousand years of brutality at the hands of other white bodies, that elite white bodies, brutalized poor white bodies, that 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 went by the time in the 1600s in Virginia, they got offered a chance to be something other than. Um, servants, other than being that which was brutalized, they got yeah. a chance to actually be white. It's the first time you begin to see in Virginia law, first time you begin to see the term white persons. At that moment, the white body became the standard of humanness. And what yeah. happened was, is that that all of that energy that 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 was brutal in them, rather than it being going towards the elite white bodies, elite white bodies gave them something else by which they could blow that trauma through. And that was through black and indigenous bodies. So the yeah. frozenness, the moral injury that white bodies have and continue to have in the society creates a frozenness in their throat, in their bodies when they begin to talk about race. This is why when white bodies, when you begin to talk to white bodies about race, you you fall into a, to a, to a number of different tropes that happen. One is the rage response. Another one is the silence response and the constriction in the body. It is not just silence in terms of intellect. There is a silence in terms of when you do embodied work, you actually begin to see white bodies struggle with this area right here in the throat, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so those pieces, I believe, are pieces because the white body has not collectively seen race, race be necessarily a problem for them because mm -hmm. they are advantaged by the structure that yeah. the, the, what they lose in the process of that is part of their humanity. 
part of their sense of 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 connection to other hum, to, to to other parts of humanity. And so and so that 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 kind of frozenness that you just put your finger on is not just a frozenness in terms of of culture. It is also a frozenness in terms of the pass down, in terms of the injury that never got dealt with among white bodies. Very interesting. Now, speaking of white bodies, in your book, you talk about, well, let me just backtrack a bit. Um, James Baldwin said somewhere that um, to be a black in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time, he says. Mm -hmm. And then the problem is how to manage that rage, because if you express it, you get into trouble. Mm -hmm. And, and um, in your book, you talk about how it's the white people that need to learn to le regulate their bodies. Like the police need to regulate their bodies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, They're not mm -hmm. trained in that, are they? You know? No. And, and I want to remind you of that famous incident in uh, Central Park. And I'll give you my take on it. There'll be Amy new. Cooper. Yeah, Amy Cooper, yeah. yeah. Who, this white woman walking the dog, letting the dog off leash, and this black man who is a bird watcher politely asks her to to leash her dog as is required by the regulations. And she ends up calling the cops that I'm being threatened by an Afro-American. And I've mm -hmm. seen that video. Yeah. And I don't know what your impression was. I don't think she was lying. I think she was a traumatized person, totally dysregulated, uh -huh. but the, e emotionally and physiologically, but the structure of the society gives her a venue to project that traumatized dysregulation onto a black person. Yeah. But 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 at the same time, Gabor, that's the piece that I'm talking about, about the standardization of the white body. Right. Yeah. That 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 she knows. See, a white woman's tears will move masses of people. A white yeah. woman crying will move a nation. A black or indigenous woman's crying will move nothing. And, 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 and mm. she knows that. And she would be the first person to say, you know, I made a mistake, but I'm not racist. Because what we mm. think is racism and what we think is racist is episodic, is if you yeah. act bad. Right. Not that you, that you are advantaged by a system that has, that has predicated within every institution that has said that you are actually the standard of humanness. Right. Yeah. And that every other body is a deviance from that standard. She knew in yeah. that moment, in that time, from the moment she was in her mama's womb, she understood those politics. She understood yeah. that a white woman calling the police could potentially be injurious, harmful and be deadly to yeah. that black bird watcher. And yeah. white people understand that. They yeah. under, see, see, when we talk about this in terms of like, if it's an episode, oh, that bad white person does that. And white people, especially white liberals, love declaring themselves apart from other white people. The de yeah. white people, white liberals love declarations of independence from other white people, right? And, 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 and not because it's too hard and too painful to actually see themselves in alignment with that. They, they think that 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 it's only about if you're nice or kind that that determines whether or not you are racist and what i've been trying to tell people is that that is the wrong um lens by which we need to be looking at racism that when you watch when you watch amy cooper make those moves what you watch was a some a body who knew that their connection to the apparatus of policing was tried true and, 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 and irrevocable. And so the idea of a white woman crying, um, um, is powerful. It is not fragile. It is, it is brutal and it is vicious. And what she was doing was being vicious. Uh, but, 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 the, but the structure in and of itself is a vicious structure. And she knows that. And I suppose the police know the same thing because they Absolutely. can get they can be totally dysregulated, outrageously right. so, as you see right. in this video sometimes, but that's considered normal behavior. That's considered normal behavior and, and the ways in which to deal with it are actually ensconced in um, things like uh, qualified, hum uh, qualified immunity.
right? The, the yeah. idea that you can shoot an unarmed black person and or unarmed black child and not, um, and, and be immune from that is, 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 is perverse on its face. Um, and so I think, I, I really think that this is why I talk about it in terms of culture, that what we're going to have to do is create a living embodied cultures, uh, one body, uh, uh, groups of bodies at a time. Um, and, and because when we talk about, when we talk about, like I said, when we talk about what happened in January 6th, what you were watching were people who were fortified by the culture. Right. Yeah. And so they, 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 and so, the, and if we are thinking that what we're going to do is develop strategy, strategy or develop allyship, right? Ally, when you, when you, when I as a black body hear white bodies talk about that they're allies, one of the first questions that I ask is, how would I know that if you hadn't have told me? Hmm. What, well, who are your people? Who are the people that you come from in terms of, uh, in terms of a living embodied anti-racist culture? Who are the people that you come from that you're going to, uh, uh, raise babies with, that you're going to bury your dead with, that you are going to create a different language nomenclature? Who are those people? If it's just you declaring that, that is inadequate to deal with this level of brutality. Well, um, to quote Risma Menachem, he said, <laughs> Many white progressives imagine they deserve a free pass because they're the good ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let me ask you, go on to something else now. So um, I'm going to quote you from uh, a book by a Canadian indigenous young woman, Helen Nott, mm. who wrote a book called In Your Own Moccasins, mm. about, her own, mm. about her own struggle with trauma, addiction, and then mm -hmm. healing and, and, and cultural um, coming home, really. And she's talking about her grandmother, just like you talk about your grandmother. Mm -hmm. And she says her grandmother is a matriarch in, in, in their community. She, mm -hmm. she knows the tradition. She speaks the wisdom. She sings the songs. But she says her bodies transform in a white dominated space, she says. Mm -hmm. um, when my grandma goes into a grocery store, ever since I can remember, she will all of a sudden, her shoulders will hunch in. Oh. And her head will face the ground. Oh. She doesn't make eye contact with people. She will just shuffle along. This happens in any kind of larger public space. Her whole presence changes. Outside of that, she's been our matriarch where she holds space. She's the one telling stories and calling people and telling people to do this or that. In her old age, she told me, because now she's 79, it's changed a bit in the last few years. She's taken a few more liberties because she's like, I don't care anymore. So that experience of having to shrink in a public space, is that something you can address? Yeah. So I just, uh, what you just said was very powerful. I, I just would like to pause on that for a second. just read this story and the thing the images the thing that popped into my head was this article that i just read or this yeah this article that i just read the other day about 215 um yeah. indigenous babies bodies bones have been found at a school at a uh behind a school here in here in Van here in british columbia in, 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 yeah in british columbia 215 yeah. babies. Last yeah. week, I just came from Tulsa, where yeah. Uh, yeah. where we had uh, Black Wall Street, where where um, white bodies, uh, because supposedly um, a a, um, a young black man said something or did something to a white woman, that yeah. um, that whole town was ripped apart and people were murdered and their land was taken and then their land was bequeathed to the white people who came in there and took the land. Um, and the banks refused to pay the people who had lost their, uh, lost their land, they refused to let them get their money out. That the, um, 
that the insurance companies refused to pay for that. And the amount of trauma that I was hearing and listening to as people were recounting this while I was down there knocked me over for about four or five days where all I had to do, all I could do was sleep as I was receiving that. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the story around the indigenous woman hunching over as she goes into white spaces is a protective response because what she understood and what she understands is that when her indigenous body comes into a space and those white bodies get uncomfortable, that white bodies, when white bodies get uncomfortable, people get hurt. When white bodies get uncomfortable, people die. When white bodies get uncomfortable, people get their land stolen, their ancestral land stolen. When people get uncomfortable, when white people get uncomfortable, white comfort trumps indigenous sovereignty. White comfort trumps black liberation. White comfort trumps. And if you don't understand that underlying rule, you put yourself and others that look like you in potential danger and your embodiment begins to, uh, begins to get shaped around that. And so I don't have to tell my children that or my parents, 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 parents didn't have to tell their children that the environment dictated that boy, you don't look in a white man's eye. Why? Because that makes them uncomfortable. And when they get uncomfortable, they kill. Um, and, and, and so we end up passing that trauma down decontextualized. It doesn't get examined. We don't explore it, but it is traumatizing nonetheless. It creates ways for us to protect and survive, but it doesn't give us the context for it. So by the time it gets to me, it shows up in my body as notions, as urgings, as vibes. And then I internalize that and think that something is wrong with me because I don't think I see other people actually experiencing that same thing, but they do. And so that is a, that story that you just told is a beautiful story about how trauma gets embedded in the body and decontextualized in a way that we don't question it. And then white bodies expect then our deference. White bodies expect bodies of culture to be deferential because that is what their bodies have been conditioned around. And the moment a black man says, you know, I am going to kneel on the football field quietly to protest police brutality and the brutality of black people in this country, he loses his job. When a, when a, when a black woman like Naomi uh, uh, black and, and um, um, a, a Asian woman, Asian body says, I am going to take care of myself and have stewardship over my own body. And therefore, I'm going to take care of that and not um, and not expose myself to the vitriol and the violence by these reporters. I'm not going to do that. She has to withdraw, even though she's taking care of her own emotional and mental health. She has to withdraw from that or accept the the viciousness and the brutality. That's what we're talking about. That's why I say this is not episodic. It's structural. It's philosophical. And that's the only way we're going to get through it is by developing ways, cultural ways of, of moving through it body to body. You know, you, you're just talking about Naomi Osaka, the uh, tennis player who withdrew yes. from the, um, the French Open just this week. And uh, you, re- you recontextualized it for me because I saw the story as the system not being sensitive enough to somebody's emotional health needs. Mm-hmm. But you just put it in a racial context. Of course, she's part black, isn't she, and part Japanese? Yeah, she- yeah. She has no sovereignty that a white man or white woman or white institution is bound to respect. That comes straight out of Dred Scott, right? None. And that, that operational ethos, it runs in and through white bodies and white structure and white context. And so 
the sovereignty, the stewardship and the sovereignty over our own bodies is is always up for debate when it comes to 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 white uh, white body supremacy. It's always up for debate. That's why I appreciate her doing that. She yeah. showed us the way. Sister Osaka showed us the way. What she said was, I, and, and, way she, and the reason why she was able to do that is because she knew she had people behind her. Yeah. She knew she had people that were going to wrap, that communally wrap their arms around her. She knew that, right? So she had to, at that point, she had to make a decision. And that's the clean and dirty pain. It is, it is, it, she, she wasn't faced with a, with a choice of pain and no pain. She yeah. was faced with a choice of clean or dirty. I could, I could, I could hold on to myself and go through it. It's still going to be painful. Yeah. Or I could just, I could just go ahead and just do it and I would feel dirty about it. I would have an experience in my literal system of I let myself down that this is dirty. And when I saw her say, well, if y'all need me to do that in order to be here, I won't be here. That was mm-hmm. so clean and so beautiful. And it was painful at the same time. Hmm. Thank you so much for that. Now I'm going to ask a final maybe a, the biggest question of all. So you very eloquently talk about you have to put this into the body context and recontextualize it, and, and it goes way beyond good intentions and way beyond yes. nice lessons in racial right. cooperation and all this stuff. Right. right. At the same time, we're still living in a system where those, like in the U.S. particularly, but also here in Canada, uh, there's a payoff to maintaining racism in the sense that it keeps people divided against each other. Uh And it also allows some people who have plenty to complain about to feel superior to other people Uh and to feel threatened by those people trying to raise themselves so that they will then, the people that are being threatened here, um, working class people whose jobs are at stake, whose the globalized economy is hollowing out their jobs, the dying deaths of despair. And now they can look down to immigrants and, 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 and black people who mm-hmm. want to uh, attain dignity yeah. as their enemy. So we have a system, which, what I'm saying is where it's not just a bunch of wrong ideas. There's a structural, right. there's a structural benefit to all that. How do you change that system? What is your vision of that? So, so first off, we have to recognize that it is a structural system and that, and that this, and that somebody is advantaged by that system, right? Yeah. That, 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 <clears throat> that after, after what I believe, after the Bacon Rebellion, when, when, when you had in, uh, uh, enslaved Africans and poor whites, um, and others, uh, 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 almost taking over Virginia. Cause this is right after this is when you start to see the laws of white persons, right? Is that they almost took over Virginia. And mm-hmm. what elite white bodies did and said was, you know, if we don't, if we don't, and they almost did it because the British couldn't get over here in time. So, so, so Bacon almost took over Virginia. If he would have done that, what would have happened, what happened was, is that he ended up getting dysentery and so it stopped a rebellion, but they almost won. What, what the lesson that elite bodies learned from that is we better begin to do something to, 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 to break this alliance up or this allegiance up or this con- connecting up between poor bodies seeing themselves as having, a, a, seeing themselves as together and our foot on their necks. Right. We better do something to break this up. And what they did was was come up with the idea in enslavement, come up with the idea of whiteness. Right. Mm. And because of the trauma brutality that poor white bodies had experienced at the hands of elite white bodies, by the time elite white bodies offered poor white bodies the chance to be to be something else, to be white. White body said, you mean I can have this and there's a possibility that, 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 that other things can happen just by looking and I break my allegiance with these enslaved Africans. Yeah, I'll take some of that, right? I will take some of that. And that, and, and that is the, and, and what happened was, is that the moment that white bodies did that is at the exact same moment they gave up part of their humanity. 
So part of this work for white bodies right now is how to reclaim their humanity by getting together with other white bodies and ushering in and developing culture and committing to that living embodied anti-racist culture for the rest of their lives, right? Mm. And, and birthing that through. And, and then seeing what other things can emerge so we can change this. But if white bodies refuse to do what it takes to slow down, settle down, pause and commit to a living and to ushering in a living embodied anti-racist culture. If they refuse to do that, they will refuse or they will continue to not have access to parts of their humanity. And that's what we're dealing with. And so my hope is that white bodies begin to take this embodied piece very seriously in terms of racism and white body supremacy and how they've been advantaged and how they have been kind of sold the okie doke around the idea of whiteness and white body supremacy. I'm I'm struck by your ability to flip things around uh, because often we talk about anti-racism programs as recognizing the human and human. Yes. Humanity yes. of the other, but you're talking, yeah. but you're talking about reclaiming one's own humanity. Not exactly. Recognizing- yeah. Exactly. Well, what I tell white folks, especially white liberals all the time and yeah. people that call themselves allies, I say, don't worry about black folks. Don't worry about indigenous folks. If y'all get this crap together around racism, y'all will stop needing to have, as, uh, as, my, el- as my ancestor Baldwin said, the end it, the, it, the, by which you put all of your ills on top of. Well, uh, Resma, I can't thank you enough for this very rich uh, and powerful conversation. Um, uh, speaking of discomfort, I, I saw that somebody in the chat line said that I'm white and this is making me uncomfortable in a good way, you know, so that um, I suppose that discomfort could be a great opening if you felt it's uncomfortable. Energy. Yeah, yeah, right. I, discomfort is energy. Yeah. Yeah. Le- explore that. Lean into it. Be curious about that uncomfortableness and don't yeah. stop being curious about it. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. And thank you for listening to The Sounds of Sand. We invite you to explore more of our talks, dialogues, videos, articles, events, and offerings through our website, scienceandnonduality.com. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please consider becoming a member to access our massive library of sand content, available exclusively to sand members. And we would love it if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify. And share this episode with your family, friends, and all sentient beings. Be well.